Welcome into another episode of Locked On Phillies, and it was not the best night for the Fightings down in Washington. Ranger Suarez looked really rough. How worried should we be about him? We'll get into it in today's episode. You are Locked On Phillies, your daily Philadelphia Phillies podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, this is Locked On Phillies. I'm your host, Connor Thomas. Thank you so much for joining us today. We come to you as part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You may know me from some of my other work in the sports talk space here in Philadelphia. I've been on air on the radio for five years at 97.5 The Fanatic Talking Sports. Uh, I've been three years a credentialed Philadelphia Phillies media member, and this is my third year as the host of Locked On Phillies. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the YouTube. All that stuff, not only will subscribing to the YouTube get you notifications when new episodes are posted, but it's the number one way to help us out here on Locked On Phillies. If you enjoy the content, that's the best way to say thank you. So I appreciate everyone who's done that and everyone who's going to do that. Today's episode is brought to you by Booking.com. Booking. Yeah, the right stay can make you a fan of any city, even your baseball rivals. So book today on Booking.com, the official accommodation partner of Major League Baseball. And you can get the Booking.com app today. Just go to the App Store. All right. Um, it was a rough night down in Washington. And part of me wants to care significantly about this because Ranger Suarez is a big piece of the puzzle. And part of me is like, well, they clinched the first round by and they've got a week and they're going to work stuff out and the postseason is different. So uh, I'm going back and forth on this one. But one thing that you can't go back and forth on is Ranger Suarez was bad last night. He talked after the game and said he did not have any feel for his command whatsoever. He only went two innings. He allowed six runs in two innings. That's a Taiwan Walker-esque stat line. He allowed one home run, two walks, only had two strikeouts, still six earned. That means there's a lot of hits in there, seven hits. It's just, it wasn't Ranger Suarez. It didn't look like him. He didn't look comfortable. He didn't look like he had any control over what he was trying to throw. And that's problematic because that's his last start of the regular season. And that brings up, and I know the Phillies only scored one run. I don't really care about that. They're half zoned out on this series, I'd imagine. We're going to talk coming up. If there's about if there's a still uh, look at the top seed, and we're also going to look at in our final segment something that was a very very remarkable feat for the Philadelphia Phillies this year in the regular season. But the big story of this is Ranger Suarez has been a plus 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 pitcher for you at points this year, and then he's been the guy where you go, where in the world did it go? And in the postseason, you need four arms, not three. Four, if you're going to win the World Series, and I'm talking about starting pitchers only. And the Phillies have two and a half, right? I guess. Let me explain. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anybody. Two and a half. Uh, I know Zach Wheeler's an arm. Uh, he's a monster. He's one of the best pitchers in baseball. I know that Aaron is an arm. He's a veteran that's had a lot of great postseason starts and regular season starts and has that pedigree. He's really, really good. Christopher Sanchez has been really good this year. He doesn't have postseason like experience, right? Now, he's been unbelievable this year. And while he has had a start or two mixed in where he hasn't been great, he's been really, really good this season. I'm not worried about Christopher Sanchez due to his performance this year. I don't think he can pitch well. Like, I'm looking at it as well, I haven't seen it in the postseason. I I know he hasn't had that experience yet. So I wonder how it translates. I wonder if he's ready for the moment. And then Ranger Suarez, I mean, heck toss-up who knows what he is at this point you just gave up six earned to the washington nationals you're not going to be playing the washington nationals come october 5th i don't know what team you're going to match up with in the nlds but that is troubling so what exactly do you do here how do you handle this um right now if I had to set up the postseason rotation which is kind of the whole conversation around this ranger suarez point right I'd be looking at Wheeler, obviously, throwing first. Nola throws second. That's no doubt to me. I have no question about that. But the third spot is interesting. Rob Thompson talked about this recently, and he said it's not just about the pitcher that you're throwing. It's about how it affects the other guys, how where they're throwing builds momentum or makes everybody comfortable. Basically this, right? Think about it this way, and this isn't fair, 
but this is reality. This is how sports work. This is how life works. Guys with experience get better opportunity. People you believe in, you've seen do it in a certain circumstance, get the better opportunities. So, and and the players know that, right? That's why Aaron Nola has always been like the, and I know Zach Wheeler was the opening day starter this year, but that's why Aaron Nola, even with Zach Wheeler on this team, was like the opening day starter and he got the ball first in the postseason and stuff like that. Because that was a guy who's been here. That's a guy who's done that. That's a guy that this team believed in. That's the guy on this team, like the longstanding veteran statesman of the starting rotation. Wheeler is a better pitcher, clearly. But he's a free agent acquisition. It's like, well, okay, you have to consider Nola's our guy. How much does it mean to him to be able to get the ball? How comfortable is he with starting first? And will Zach Wheeler care, right? So, like, basically, for example – do you think that it's a confidence boost for Aaron Nola to throw first? And this is not happening. Like Zach Wheeler's throwing first, but I'm talking about previous seasons. Like it may be a confidence boost for Nola to throw first. Zach Wheeler may not really care if he throws second. And in that case, you might throw Nola one, Wheeler two, even if Wheeler's the better pitcher. Like you have to consider people who write off emotion in sports, who write off like the way that guys react to decisions emotionally. Uh, that's a huge part of it. I don't know how you just flat out kick that to the curb. So that all leads into the conversation of, yeah, Ranger Suarez was really, really bad yesterday. And he has not looked great recently. But he's been really good in the postseason. So do you gain more from throwing him third and showing belief and confidence in him? Does that inspire him? Uh, what does it say to Ranger Suarez if you throw Christopher Sanchez first? And if you move Ranger Suarez to the fourth spot in the playoff rotation, does that lead to him saying, damn, man, they just moved me back in the rotation. I know I'm not throwing well. They know I'm not throwing well. Now he gets in his head. I know on the surface Ranger Suarez looks cool, calm, and collected. But trust me, he's got emotions in there. He does. He's a normal person just like you and I. If he gets bumped back in the postseason rotation from where he's been the past couple of years, like remember when he went three innings against the Braves and Rob Thompson pulled him and then they had that masterful bullpen game to win a game in the NLDS last year, Ranger Suarez was ticked off. He's like, what in the world are you doing? Why am I out of this ball game? I am dominating them. And then after the game, he was like, okay, I get it. Strategy worked. We feel good. But remember, he's a competitor. He does show emotion at times. It, not fielding a ground ball, but in the, in the dugout in conversation with the manager, Ranger Suarez does show emotion. So that's something you have to consider. All of these factors are things that Rob Thompson are trying to put together. Now, if it was up to me, and this is from the outside looking in, I don't know how you could possibly throw Ranger Suarez over Christopher Sanchez unless, unless you're in a situation where you win game one and game two. Let's say you win one and two in Philadelphia in the NLDS because it will be in Philadelphia. Wheeler wins, Nola wins, and you have that game three and you roll into wherever you're playing, whether it's New York or Atlanta or San Diego or Arizona or wherever it is. Um, Milwaukee, who, who knows where you end up sliding out at this point. But then we're going to talk about that coming up. Uh, but whoever you face and you roll in 2-0, you might say, OK, we're going to throw Ranger and try and get away with one here that's what i would look at it as because ranger suarez is a guy that's comfortable on the road and christopher sanchez has been not good on the road if it's a hey we got our backs against the wall well then it gets tricky because what i just said about ranger suarez being good on the road and good in hostile environments in the postseason in the past well christopher sanchez has been really good at home and really bad on the road in the uh in the regular season so uh, i don't know here's what i will say Right. If anyone's freaking out about this conversation, like Connor, you're bringing up all of these issues with the starting rotation. They're in trouble. I don't have as much faith in this team as I did when you started this second. Look at all the other teams in baseball, guys. There are no teams with rotations, really, that can match up with this Phillies team. There are bullpens that might be comparable. There are offenses that might be slightly comparable. But there's no starting rotation that you're going to put head to head with Wheeler, Nola, Suarez, Sanchez and say, I feel good about those games. Like, at best, maybe you can match them, but it's not a bad spot to be in. It's just a tricky conversation. And you know, it would have made it a lot easier if Rangers Warriors went out there last night and didn't give up <laughs> six runs in two innings. I, I mean, 
it's always got to be interesting with the Philadelphia Phillies, doesn't it, folks? Uh, a 9 1 loss last night to the Washington Nationals. Just one of those kind of ugly, sloppy games where you're like, did that even happen? Do we even really have to talk about that? But listen, part of it is my job. Part of it is uh, important because there's still a one seed on the line. Or is there? We're going to take a look at the standings around the National League and the breakdown of everything. Just your latest update on what's going on, whether or not the Phillies are still trying to chase down the one seed. We'll talk about that coming up as we continue today's episode of Lock on Phillies. But let's talk about tonal first. Tonal is the absolute best. For those of us who thrive on getting stuff done, including workouts, every minute counts. It's important to be efficient. That's why you need tonal, the smart strength training system that takes the guesswork out of working out so you can make sure you're making the most of every rep. Tonal is the world's smartest and most effective strength training system that helps get you stronger. Uh, powered by AI, tonal learns with every rep. How awesome is that? So it can deliver workouts personalized just for you. Internal learns from your movement and provides suggested weight recommendations for every move. Like I can feel if you're herky jerkying the weights, it'll know, hey, that might be too much weight, buddy. Tone it back. Or if you're like me and you're just absolutely jacked to the gills, you might say, bro, that's too easy for it. But Tonal thinks about all of this stuff so you don't have to. It's like having a personal trainer at home with you as Tonal will optimize every workout just for you. Unlike traditional gym equipment, Tonal uses adaptive digital weight to advance your training techniques from professional athletes to, hey, for example, a mom of three. Tonal is trusted by thousands who have become the strongest version of themselves. So right now, Tonal's offering our listeners $200 off your Tonal purchase with promo code Locked On MLB. That's Tonal.com and use promo code Locked On MLB for $200 off your purchase. That's a great deal. Again, that's Tonal.com, promo code Locked On MLB. For two hundred dollars off. All right, let's take a peek in at the standings because the Phillies dropping that game in Washington. Well, okay, that does make it a little bit tougher to get the one seed, and we know that they're not really trying to chase down the one seed, but they kind of are. The Phillies have two more games remaining. They are two games back on the Los Angeles Dodgers. So the only way that you'd be able to get the one seed would be if the Dodgers lost the final two games to the Rockies and you won the final two games against the Nationals. And, folks, I don't think that the Dodgers are going to lose two straight to the Rockies. I don't know how much they're rolling back you know, playing guys there in Colorado, but I'm talking about L.A. Um, I don't know how much they're like taking days off or how Dave Roberts is managing that for the Los Angeles Dodgers. But what I do know is that it's – it's a win for the Dodgers away from the Phillies being locked into the two seed. And pretty much they're already locked into the two seed. Now, something to keep an eye on is the Yankees a game back and the Guardians two games back. And you say, hmm, both those teams have the tiebreaker over the Phillies. I would prefer to be the home team in the World Series if it does get that far. So you might still watch that. I think you try and find, like, I'm comfortable if you find one more win. Now, you can find two more. Washington's not that good of a team. Ranger Suarez was really bad last night, but you can find a way to victory. But uh, the question is, is there still a look at the top seed? And let me use a golf analogy for all those golfers out there. Is there still a look at making birdie on a, I don't know, 600-yard par five if your second shot is like 200 yards out or third shot is 200 yards out, maybe topped one? Like, yeah, technically. There's an outside chance at it. If I flush a five iron, stick it to two feet, and finally make a putt for once in my life. But it's not likely, right? A lot of stuff has to go right. That doesn't seem all that probable to happen. So it seems that the dream of the one seed is gone. It seems like the Dodgers will have the top seed in all of baseball. Credit to them. They've had a great regular season. They have an absolute superhuman. I don't even know if I can call him a superhuman. He's more than superhuman in Shohei Otani. And he's been absolutely carrying that team to greatness this year. We'll see if it carries in the postseason, considering he has not played in it yet. But the one seed is pretty much, it's all wrapped up. I don't really see any way for the Philadelphia Phillies to track that down. And there's no way for the Brewers to track down the Phillies from behind or the Padres. Uh, so you just play out the rest of the schedule. You take it easy. You don't worry about anything. I mean, it would be cool if the Phillies won two and the Dodgers lost two. I just... You think the Colorado Rockies are winning too? Maybe for like Charlie Blackman, who's retiring at the end of the season. Like, maybe. But 
don't hold your breath, folks. It seems like the setup for the postseason in the National League is going to be Dodgers one, one seed, Phillies two seed, Brewers three seed, Padres four seed. I believe they've already been clinched into that four seed spot. But then where it gets interesting is who will be five and six. I love what's going on here. The Atlanta Braves are 87 and 71. The New York Mets are 87 and 71. The Arizona Diamondbacks are 88 and 72. When you counter out all of those with how many games they have left to play, that means they are all eight games back of the Dodgers. They all have the exact same win-loss record based on how it sets up in the standings. Now, obviously, Arizona has played two more games because the Mets and Braves got rained out of their final two games of their head-to-head -head series thanks to Hurricane Helene. So will they play those extra two games if they need to? And it looks like they're going to need to. But what does that mean for the Phillies? Well, what that means is those teams are struggling to find their way into the postseason. And they're going to have to burn guys to get in. Or maybe they'll save guys for the wild card round. But guess what? Then you're going to have burned those guys in the wild card round. Actually, you know what's kind of weird, right? It may not play in the Philadelphia Phillies' favor that this has been so tight to find the final two spots in the wild card round between Atlanta and the Mets and the Arizona Diamondbacks. One of those teams is going to be on the outside looking in. Uh, part of the reason why I don't think it's going to play so well is these guys may have to throw their best arms in the final couple games of the regular season, which means in the wild card series, there's a chance that these teams do not have their best arms available. But whoever comes out of the wild card series may have a full rest ace ready to go against the Phillies and Zach Wheeler in game one of the NLDS. Like normally, what would happen is, or what you'd want to happen is, wild cards are locked up. The guys throw their one and two and maybe three, depending on how long the wild card series goes. And then you have the day off and then you play in the NLDS and you don't have your ace available. And you get a game in favor of the higher seed, the home team. Instead, now, like, for example, Atlanta, if they throw Chris Sale the final game of the regular season, they win two games in the wild card series. You're going to get Sale game one in the NLDS. And that's... Well, that's a tall task. That's a nightmare scenario right there. So that's why it's not exactly ideal for the Philadelphia Phillies, what's happening right there. You'd rather them lock stuff up so they can set up their rotation to throw their best guys. But I don't know. We'll see. And we'll also see uh, – you heard me bring up how Hurricane Helene caused the postponement of two games between the Mets and the Atlanta Braves down there in Atlanta. Those games probably have to be played based on standing. Do they push back the wild card round? Like that's <laughs> – it's such a wild situation considering September is hurricane season, especially down there in Atlanta. And you know you have two pivotal games and you don't have a buffer built in. You don't have a, and you don't want to build a buffer because the advantage to teams like the Phillies and the Dodgers and the Yankees and the Guardians on the other side of the bracket is that you get the days off that other teams do not. But you've got to find some type of contingency plan that those games can get played in spite of the weather. Unfortunately, baseball is a game that more than any other of the four major North American sports is dependent on the weather. And the Braves and Mets are in a tough spot. And Arizona has been scuffling. So, I don't know. You look at those teams and you should say, hey, the Phillies are better, clearly, than all of those teams. But there are certain little nuances as they try and lock down seeding and the other teams try and lock down seeding that might put the Philadelphia Phillies in a bit of an uncomfortable position. At the end of the day, the best team is going to win. That's it. The team that's playing the best. Well, not the best team, right? Not the best record, not the most talent. We saw that over the past couple of seasons. But the team that is playing the best baseball will find their way to victory, whether it's a tough matchup, easy matchup, anything. The Phillies have, come on, we're going to be scared of tough matchups now when we're the two seed after what you did to Atlanta the past two years, after what you did to San Diego, after what you did to St. Louis, after what you did to, well, Miami wasn't. Sorry, all due respect to the Marlins. Ricochet shot there. Whatever. Uh, you, you get my point. The Phillies have been through tough postseason matchups and prevailed in the past. So I'm not going to go ahead and treat it like, oh, well, tough matchup. They can't do it. But there is a way to set up your path where you're feeling better. And by the way, the Phillies are going to be playing the um, – you're looking at it. So the Brewers will play the lowest wild card seed. And the two middle wild card seeds 
will play the Phillies, whoever ends up winning that game. So uh, you'll see who ends up coming out of there. You want it to be well, – who do you want it to be? Who even knows? I mean, do you want it to be the Padres? No, they're red hot right now, and they look like they're going to be the uh, the top wild card seed. Um, you or actually, do the Phillies get the? I gotta look at the. This bracket is just so messed up because there's three teams tied at eight, so they don't even have it figured out right now. Bottom line is, a lot of stuff to get figured out, and it may take a little bit longer than expected because of the games rained out. The Phillies have done all they can ask for. They got the first round by, and they're in comfortable positioning. But they've also done something else completely remarkable. And I don't think we've given this enough love, not just on this podcast, but as a fan base, but baseball in general. This is such a huge part of the equation. And Rob Thompson deserves in, an incredible amount of credit. I know people rip him. An incredible amount of credit to Topper on this one. We'll talk about it coming up as we wrap up Locked On Phillies. But first, I want to talk about Booking.com. Booking. Yeah, this is just a great opportunity for you to travel if you're a Philadelphia Phillies fan. They have opportunities for you. Well, they always have opportunities for you to travel. But think about like a Phillies fan heading to, let's say you match up with uh, the Diamondbacks and you want to go to Arizona. I've made that trip recently. Phoenix, fun town. Maybe you're a Phillies fan heading to your the Diamondback City to catch a baseball game, a postseason baseball game. And you want your team to win, but you're also excited to check out like downtown Phoenix. You want to try some of the great Mexican food they have out there. You want to see the desert, drive around a little bit. You got all this stuff you want to check out. And you end up falling in love with that baseball rival city. I will tell you, the Diamondbacks annoyed the heck out of me. I love Phoenix. I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't gone there. And I wouldn't have gone there if it wasn't for Booking.com. So go ahead and check it out. I mean, Booking.com. Booking dot, yeah, is the best place to go ahead and set your vacation schedule, book everything through that app or the website to get the right stay, which can make you a fan of any U.S. city, even your baseball rivals. They're an official accommodation partner of Major League Baseball. So go ahead and check them out. The app, the website, booking.com, booking dot, yeah. All right, let's discuss what I think may be the most impressive feat for the Philadelphia Phillies this year. Uh, I don't even know if it's a feat. Part of it's luck. I've knocked on wood on this desk for 160 baseball games. I'm going to continue to do it for the last two, and I'm going to continue to do it through the postseason, however long this run goes. But uh, luck is part of it. Management is part of it. And you may be putting together what I'm getting at here. If you know when I knock on wood throughout the course of the podcast – the Philadelphia Phillies are unbelievably healthy going into the postseason. I've already knocked on wood. I will do it one more time just in case. But you look at it and you say, okay, starting rotation. Nola, Suarez, Sanchez, Wheeler. You have delivered a healthy starting rotation or starting four. Tyler Walker is healthy even if he stinks. And Spencer Turnbull is probably the only exception to this conversation, right? Right. And he was a guy that was brought in to be just kind of a depth option for the Philadelphia Phillies, maybe a long relief guy. And then because Walker was hurt, he stepped into a role. He looked really good. We'll see if he comes back at some point, maybe in the NLCS. He'll have Spencer Turnbull, like, go be a low leverage guy in the bullpen, but it seems less likely by the day. All right, injuries are going to happen, but think about it. That might be the only one for the Philadelphia Phillies that you're really even remotely concerned about. And I'm not talking about performance. I'm talking about injuries. Let's look at the lineup for the Philadelphia Phillies, right? JT's healthy. He had knee surgery this year. They managed him so, so well to make sure he's ready for the postseason. Bryce Harper, listen, if you have a question about how healthy he is, he played in the game yesterday against the Nationals. He's fine. Like, he's banged up a little bit in the elbow and the wrist, and he's working through stuff. I'm sure he's sore and everything, but there are guys that are sore. I'm talking about not able to play. Bryce Harper is able to play. He's able to make an impact. And for a guy that's had injury issues in the past, guy that missed time with hamstring injury this year, like, he's good to go. He's ready. Bryson Stott has been absolute fine all year. They've taken care of him. They've given him days off where he needed to. Trey Turner had issues with that hamstring injury. He came back after missing a month. Uh, Alec Bohm had issues with his hand. Could have been the, the ham ate bone. 
Uh, I've had a buddy who did that in college, and he just missed an entire season. I mean, that's a season ender. Got lucky. Dodged a bullet. Uh, Kyle Schwarber in the DH spot. Hamstring issue. Could have been more serious. Dodged a bullet. Uh, out in left field, Austin Hayes. Kidney infection. He's back and playing now. Like, it's great to have him back. He's got to work out of some stuff still, but you acquire him at the deadline, and then he has – a hamstring injury, and then he has a kidney infection, and you say, okay, well, we're going to have to get lucky that he gets back and feels better in time. Wonderful. Brandon Marsh, dude, was he also a hamstring injury? I feel like the Phillies have had so many darn hamstring injuries, but nothing that is majorly crippling. He's good to go. Rojas has been healthy. In right field, Nick Castellanos is, damn, like, look at him. He's Cal Ripken, right? He's playing every game. Now, maybe I wouldn't put it that far, but uh, he's going to play all 162 baseball games. He's been healthy all year long. Look at the bench. Edmundo Sosa is good to go. He had a little bit of back spasms uh, a couple weeks ago, but he's ready. You, know, like, you have such a great setup, and not to mention the bullpen. Alvarado comes back from injury. He's good. Strom and Hoffman have been good all year. Kirkering has been good all year. Like your Carlos Estevez has been good since you acquired him from the Los Angeles Angels. Jose Ruiz is in a good spot. Like you have so many guys that the littlest thing could go wrong. Come back or off the leg, hit by a pitch, tweak something in the ankle at the wrong time in the past couple weeks. And the next thing you know, Man, well, that hamstring injury that only cost you two weeks before, well, it cost you two weeks now, but part of that is the NLDS. And you got to survive something. It is remarkable how healthy the Philadelphia Phillies are right now. And a lot of that credit goes to Rob Thompson. I can bring up luck all day till the cows come home. Do people still use that expression? Uh, but bottom line is Rob Thompson put out a lot of lineups this year that people ripped him for. Fans, people on the radio. Uh, people on TV, people on Twitter and social media ripped him apart for. Why is he giving this guy an off day? He's a young player. He doesn't need it. Why is this guy resting? Why is this lineup the way that it is? And everyone complained and argued and moaned all season long about those give up lineups. And now when the Philadelphia Phillies are heading into the postseason with a fully healthy roster outside of Spencer Turnbull, who wasn't even supposed to be part of the postseason rotation because you have four guys better, like you end up seeing what the grand strategy was. And that's why I tell you over and over and over, chill out, calm down. When you put out those lineups that have guys getting days off, oh, they have a day off tomorrow. Why is this guy getting a day off today? Probably because he needs it. We don't talk to these players every day. Could you imagine how hard it would be to like sit at a bus stop and evaluate whether or not people walking by you feel good physically? Like there are some that are obvious. A guy walks by with a cane and he's hobbling and everything like that. And you say, oh, well, man, that guy is dragging. He probably doesn't feel good today. Guy walks by, looks pretty spry. Oh, okay. He's moving pretty well. He's got a little pep in his step. He's probably fine. But you're shooting in the dark from that type of perspective. That's how we are with the Philadelphia Phillies. Rob Thompson talks to these guys. He walks up to him and he says, yo, Alec Bohm, how you feeling, man? You good? Body sore at all? Could you use a day? Do you want a day? Do you want to keep playing? Oh, hey, Trey, uh, you came back from that hamstring thing. We're going to slow you down a little bit. Oh, never mind. You feel good? All right, we'll play you an extra game or two than we were planning to. Like These conversations happen. We're not privy to them. We need to start trusting Rob Thompson more. We do, man. It's crazy the amount of disrespect this guy gets with the success that he's had in this city as far as winning baseball games on both the regular season and the postseason level. And now he's done something that is near impossible. Over 162 games, he has delivered a healthy team to the postseason. That's incredible. You might say, oh, well, Connor, they did that last year. No, they didn't. Reese Hoskins blew out his knee in spring training. It's so hard to get through the season without a devastating injury. Basically, every team has it. And the Philadelphia Phillies have avoided it. And a lot of that credit goes to Rob Thompson. So as they wrap up the final two games, one more for good measure, knock on wood, so they don't jinx anything with that segment. Uh, make sure everyone's still healthy, but make sure you're continuing to get good outings from your starting pitchers, better than what Ranger Suarez gave you, and put yourself in prime position to be hot in October. These games might feel like a wash, but I would like to see one more strong performance from the Philadelphia Phillies, maybe tonight. Um, 
before the season wraps up. That's all for today's episode of Locked On Phillies. Thank you so much for checking us out. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Please make sure you're rating, reviewing, subscribing to the YouTube, all that great stuff. And check out Locked On MLB Next, the Locked On MLB Podcast with Paul Francis Sullivan. Sully covers baseball in general. So go ahead and get the overarching national perspective on everything going on. It's available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So check Locked On MLB out next. And I will talk to you on Monday on our next episode of Locked on Phillies.